Well, good morning again, everyone. I want to welcome those of you who are joining us online and also those of you in the CLC. We're glad you're with us too. Hey, now how many of you were thinking this when you came in? Is he going to wear a Seahawks jersey? <laughs> Few of you? Now, if you're not football fans, if you're not football fans, you, you might be wondering, what is he talking about? There's a little game this afternoon between the Seattle Seahawks and the Minnesota Vikings. I'm from Seattle. Okay, and the reason I have a good reason for not wearing my jersey, it's this. I'm keeping it clean for Pastor Bill because we have a little bet going. If the Seahawks win, he's going to wear it the next time he preaches. I think he agreed to that. I'm, I'm not sure. And, and if the, the, the miraculous happens and the Seahawks lose, uh, this is the shirt I'm going to wear. I'm going to wear a shirt that says, Real Men Don't Hunt. Now, that, uh, the next time I preach will be just in time for all those hunters to return from their camps, hopefully out of ammunition by that point, right? <laughs> or maybe I'll wear a Vikings jersey. I, I don't know. I don't know. How many of you are shorthanded around your house because of the hunting opener? Some of you. Uh, how many of you are really glad for that extra hour of sleep last night? How many of you forgot that you had an extra hour of sleep last night and you showed up to church early today, all right? <laughs> or you woke up and you just forgot? Well, we're glad you're here, however uh, you ended up here, at whatever time you ended up here. Uh, we're starting a new series, as I mentioned earlier, called Experience, Worship, Grow, Impact. And those three words describe our Hosanna experience. Don't they? You hear those words a lot, worship, grow, impact. In fact, those words paint a picture for us of, of what it looks like to be fully engaged at Hosanna. Someone who is fully engaged at Hosanna. Worship, grow, impact. That describes you. In fact, you could even say for those who are on board with the mission and vision of Hosanna that those are expectations of each and every one of us that we are worshiping and we're growing and we're making an impact with our lives. And we don't want you to just hear those words or, or even um, remember them or just, just understand them. We want you to experience them. We want you to live them. And so each week of this three-week series, we're going to drill into one of those words, and this week is experience worship, which means we're going to do a little more worship this weekend, and that means the sermon's going to be a little bit shorter. Now, someone last night cheered, and we immediately had that person escorted out <laughs> into the atrium at that point, so I know none of you are feeling that way. Actually, we're going to have multiple messages um, <laughs> that are going to be throughout the service, so you can cheer about that. Uh, we're, we're, we're excited about this series. It's a little bit different. The format, even, even today, will feel a little bit different, but we're excited about it. So let's start with this question uh, right off the bat. What is worship? It's a fundamental question. What is true worship according to the Bible? And thankfully, there's a verse in Scripture. There are a number of verses in Scripture that respond to that question, but there's one that, that, that very directly responds to it because at the end of this verse, it, it says, this is true worship. So here is the verse, Romans 12.1. We're going to read through it, if you follow along with me. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters. The Apostle Paul is writing to the church in Rome, and can you sense the urgency there? In view of God's mercy, say that phrase with me, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is true worship. So the, the question, what does true worship look like? What does the experience of true worship look like? There's a direct response. This is true worship. So let's break this verse down just for a few moments. First of all, Paul says to, to offer our bodies, bodies plural. Other places in Scripture, the word body, singular, is used to describe the whole body of believers, the church. But here it's bodies plural, which means that Paul is addressing not just the group as a whole, but addressing individuals within the group. And he's saying, this is what true worship looks like, and it, it means something for you individually, you personally. And Paul is saying, if you want to understand what true worship is, then, then I'm speaking to you individually. And just like Paul was doing that back then, God's word is doing that to us today. True worship, this is what it means for you personally, and for you individually, and for you personally, and for you and you. It's a personal thing. It is for sure something that we do as a group, but it's also something that we do personally. And then the, the use of this word body, there's a holistic sense to this, which Paul is saying, offer your whole body, not part of your body, not part of your life or part of yourself, offer the whole thing, the whole thing. 
if you want to experience true worship. The whole thing. And what that means for us is that worship is not just something that we do on the weekend for an hour or so. It's something that we, that we do every day in every hour of every day. Offer your whole body, your whole life, your whole self. Are you with me here? The whole thing. Which means that worship isn't just about our Sunday world. It's about our Monday world and our Tuesday world and our Wednesday and so on. True worship. An experience of true worship. In fact, Pastor Bill always asks us when we're preparing a service, what is what we do on Sunday? How does that make a difference in their Monday world? And that's, that's what we're thinking about here when it comes to true worship. It's our whole lives. It's our whole selves, our whole body. And then Paul says to offer your whole selves as a living sacrifice. Sacrifice. Sacrifice has been a part of worship, both pagan and Christian worship, at least prior to Jesus, throughout the, throughout the ages. Throughout the ages, pagan worship has required a sacrifice of an animal or or even a person. The Old Testament, there is, is example after example after example of God's people being asked to make a sacrifice at the temple. Why were they making a sacrifice? They were making a sacrifice to uh, account for their sin, to cover their sin, to receive God's mercy, a sacrifice was required. Now back to that phrase, and this is, this is the key phrase. This is the linchpin to the whole thing. If we're going to understand Christian worship and sacrifice, I had you say it, in view of God's mercy. In view of God's mercy. For us as Christians, we do no longer have to make sacrifices of dead things. Jesus has paid the ultimate sacrifice on the cross on our behalf so that we can experience God's mercy. Before Jesus, sacrifice to receive God's mercy. With Jesus, we receive God's mercy. And although we no longer have to make dead sacrifices, Paul says, now that you are in view of God's mercy, offer your body, your whole life, as not a dead sacrifice, but a living sacrifice. The whole thing. God wants it all. Not because we have to to receive his mercy, but because we have received his mercy. Our response is to be a living sacrifice, which may mean, if we're going to be a living sacrifice in our lives, that we may have to make some sacrifices in our lives. We may have to sacrifice something from our time, our calendar, our resources, our agendas, our plans. God wants us to offer our entire lives to him. There's a story in the Gospels, a man approaches Jesus and he, and he says, I, I've been successful, I've been successful in life, I've been successful in religion, I go to church every week, I follow all the laws, I play it straight, and he says to Jesus, is there anything else I need to do? And Jesus says, yeah, just give me it all, give me your whole life. That man walks away, but today... As we consider the experience of true worship, God is saying to each and every one of us to pour your whole life out, the whole thing. Don't hold anything back. You know, this is a series that's experiential in nature. And so throughout the service, we're going to do some things experientially, including right now. You're going to have the experiential um, time of reflection. And specifically, we're going to invite you to reflect on and respond to this idea of true worship, the experience of true worship being your whole life poured out as a living sacrifice. During this time, you may want to pray as the music is, is playing. You may want to just listen to God. What is he saying to you personally? Remember, this is about you and you and you. There'll be some questions up on the screen. They're the same questions that are in your bulletin, and we would invite you uh, to interact and experience this topic, maybe even write some responses. But the question before each one of us is, how will we begin to pour out our whole lives as a living sacrifice? Let me pray with you before we move into this reflection time. 
God, thank you for making the ultimate sacrifice so that we can, in freedom and in fullness, live out true worship, to offer our whole lives as as a living sacrifice, not just on Sunday, but on Monday and Tuesday and every day and every aspect and every second of our lives. And I pray that each one of us would be caught up in this moment to personally consider what this means for us. Move Holy Spirit, speak to us. In Jesus' name, amen. May each of you continue to grow in your understanding and experience of what it means to pour your whole life out in worship to God. Now, God certainly wants us to experience all the fullness of worship out there, outside of the time that we spend together in here. But he also wants us to experience all the fullness of worship together on the weekend as we worship in, in a service like this. In fact, what happens in here should fuel and form our lives out there. Another way to say it might be that, that what happens in here is a microcosm of our lives out there. One little example of this would be that sometimes in worship in here, 
we may feel like we want to sing out or maybe, maybe express ourselves in worship in a way that we never have before, but we have this thought, what will others around me think? There's a self-consciousness. And in a worship service like this, God would say, lose that self-consciousness. Let it go, let go, and experience and encounter God more directly and intimately. And if that happens in here, wouldn't that be a good thing if it happened more out there? Care less about what others think <laughs> so that we can experience more of what God has for us in our lives. Just one example of how this is a microcosm of life out there. Now, someone who knows a little bit, I think, about worship and worship services here at Hosanna is our worship pastor, Chris Gresseth. Would you listen and watch the screens with me? Hey, everybody. Chris here. I am so thankful to be talking to you about worship today. I can't believe on the one week that we're talking about worship that I'm gone. But my brother's getting married, and so I'm celebrating with him and his wife, Andrea, in North Carolina. But I'll be home with you soon, and I'm looking forward to that. Let's put a scripture up on the screen. It simply says, Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Would you say that with me? Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. And I love that. And that's what we do every Sunday and Saturday night when we come together and worship. I love worshiping with this congregation. You know, the scriptures are filled with great examples of people coming together to worship. They would call that the great assembly. I'll never forget that, that first time I was asked to lead worship. I was 15 years old and I thought, how in the world am I gonna do this? I was just, I was completely scared. And um, that night I went in my room and I prayed like, Lord, teach me how to do this, help me. And I grabbed my Bible, just flipped it open randomly. And this is what I read. It's in 2 Chronicles chapter 5. Indeed, it came to pass when the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to the Lord, praising and thanking him. They lifted up their voices with the trumpeters, cymbals, and instruments of music, praising God, saying, for he is good and his mercy endures forever. That the house, the house of the Lord, just like the church, was filled with a cloud so that the priest couldn't continue ministering because of this cloud. For the glory of the Lord filled the house of God. I want to say that one more time. The glory of the Lord filled the house of God. Now you hear me say it from time to time, but there is a powerful thing that happens when we come together in worship. And this is a great example of it. You see, they begin to lift up their voices to the Lord and God's presence came. That's what that cloud represented. It represented the Holy Spirit, God's presence. And this happens to us that the glory of the Lord fills this place, fills our hearts when we come together and worship. Jesus himself said, when two or three are gathered in my name, there I am in the midst of you. And when we worship together, Christ is with us. And we see him in our perspective. And I believe that all we need is found in the presence of God. You can know the voice of God. You can know his leading. The scripture says that when we call, he answers. And if we draw close, he'll draw close to us. And this is seen here in this scripture. What I love about the scripture is that in the subsequent verses, or previously to this, it says that the priests didn't hold to their own divisions. You know, there's a lot of divisions that they could have held to. They could have said, I'm not a part of this generation. I'm older, I'm younger. Or, hey, I'm from a different family or maybe a different race or whatever. But they came together. They put those divisions to the side and came together. And I want to encourage us to continue to do that. I believe we do that. Scripture says this, that one generation will praise you to the next. I love seeing grandkids sitting with grandparents and everybody singing and worshiping together. What an amazing thing. We can put our divisions to the side and come together and worship corporately. We do that. And I believe there's power in that. From there, the scripture says that they begin to sing and lift their voice. You know, that speaks to the expression that's that are done in worship. And oftentimes, I get questions on that. They'll say, Chris, how should we worship when we come together? What does the Bible have to say? And the easy way that I like to say it is, we believe in a full expression of worship. We all need to be on the journey with how scripture says to worship. And simply a good way that I like to say it is that it starts off with, be still and know that I am God. That's a valid expression of worship. Just to be still and say, Lord, I believe that you are God in my situation. I'm gonna honor that right now. But on the far side of the spectrum is to clap and shout for God. And things in the middle would be like kneeling before the Lord or to clap, or to lift up holy hands to God. We all need to be on that journey. You know, for me, 
uh, singing was something that I was incredibly um, nervous about. I remember as a young boy not wanting to sing in church, but one day I realized that this is what Scripture said, and I was wrestling with singing then in service, and I just decided I'm going to sing out. And I remember my grandpa uh, standing next to me after the service said, Chris, I heard you singing today. It's great to hear you sing today. He affirmed me. And I want to say, I want, I want to affirm you and say, keep lifting your voice to the Lord. Stay on the journey with expressions of worship because that draws us closer to God. Another one for me was lifting my hands. I was, I was so self-conscious about that. I was an eighth grader. I was in a service, and I remember the song that we were singing. The words said, you're all I want. You're all I've ever needed. Help me know you are near. And I felt the Holy Spirit rising up in my heart to lift my hands. And I remember being so self-conscious, I just lifted my palms, but kept my arms down so no one could see me. And uh, But from there, I felt this release and freedom in my heart. Like, Lord, no, this doesn't matter. I'm going to surrender to you. Lifting our hands biblically just simply means that, it, well, Scripture says to lift up holy hands without wrath or doubting. And what I love about that is we're not lifting our hands in anger to God, but no, with no wrath and without doubting, Lord, I'm here for you. And we surrender to him. And in that, the worshiper, we draw close to God. So let's be on the journey together in these worship expressions. When we come together corporately, this is the way the Bible says to do it. Just those two expressions I highlighted, but there's many more. But be on the journey with that, and we'll do it together. You know, I want to leave you with a, a story. A couple of years ago, a woman came up to me after a service and said, Chris, I've been so sick, I haven't wanted to come to church. And I said, I'm sorry. And she said, my husband woke me up this morning and said, I know we haven't been going, you've been sick, but I want you to go. So she said, I didn't want to go, but I went because he asked me to. So here now she came to church, not feeling well, sat down in her seat. And then the next thing you know is I asked her to stand to worship. She said, well, you asked me to stand. And of course I said, oh, you don't have to stand. You know, you can be seated. And she said, no, you asked me to do it. And I, I wanted to do it. So I, I stood, but I didn't feel well. Then you asked me to sing. I said, oh, you don't have to sing. It's, it's okay. You know, if you aren't feeling well, it's all right. And she said, no, you asked me to, so I did. And then you asked us to pray a prayer in our own words. And she said, I didn't want to. I've been so sick. I'm in so much pain in that moment. I didn't want to pray. But because you asked, I did. She said, somewhere in the middle of my prayer, I began to realize that my pain had left. That I was able to move in ways I hadn't moved before that I realized that I had been completely healed in this moment. And I, I love that story because the, the, the statement is true that God is in the midst of us when we worship, that he inhabits the praises of his people. And that woman in that moment was touched in an incredible way, in a very physical and tangible way through healing. And it's not just about a healing that happens. What I'm trying to say is that God knows where you are. He knows what's going on in your life. And as we draw closer to him in worship, he will draw close to us. Always remember that the Father is seeking worshipers. He's seeking you. I know you're here to seek him. But if we will worship in spirit and in truth, he will seek us. If you draw close to God, he will draw close to you. Call and he will answer. These scriptures are true. In just a few moments, the band's going to come out and begin to lead you in worship. And I want to encourage you to be on the journey. Maybe try a new expression. Sing like you've never sung before. It's going to be a great experience. I want to pray with you. Lord, I thank you for these worshipers. God, that we get the opportunity to worship together on a weekly basis. God, we ask that you would teach us, lead us and guide us, whether we might follow you more closely. God, we ask that your presence would come in a powerful way today, whether we might know you better. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. We'll see you soon, guys.